So good evening and welcome to our Dhamma session tonight. Topic for tonight is, for, for lack of a really good translation, it's the Pali word bala. Bala. Bala is often translated as power, but I want to go a little broader than that. Power is a good translation. I think it can also mean energy. Power gives a little bit of a specific con connotation in English that might not be exact. Because a lot of meditators or people who practice meditation in various traditions talk a lot about energy. So I thought it'd be, for that, that's one reason why it would be interesting to talk about energy in Buddhism, energy, power, these are these ideas, because I think it's one and the same, really. But another important reason is to just remind us the power, um, and, and thereby the consequences, you know, of things, the potential. Power is a very important part of our learning experience. There's a power to so many things, right? We talk about this in daily discourse, and if you think about it, there's much, there's much to do with power that is in, that is of interest to, to Buddhists and meditators. The various types of power that exist. The Buddha talked a lot about. Well, no, he talked about different kinds of power. So the first powers that the Buddha talked about are physical power, like the power of the sun. The sun's a very powerful thing. Without it, we'd all be dead. We would have never been born. There would be no life on earth without the sun. Not in this form, anyway. There might be angels, there would be spirits, but the sun is a powerful force in our lives. The power of the moon. The sun and the moon were like gods in ancient India. They were these super mundane forces. The, earth, the, the moon has power over the earth, right? The tides. Some people say our emotions, our moods, can be even affected by the moon. And of course, the many physical powers on earth. There's the power of storms, the power of earthquakes, the powers... powers that exist, forces of gravity. If you jump out of a 10-story building, there's a lot of power that uh, takes its toll on you, on you, forces you, makes you fall to your death. And, and these may seem inconsequential in Buddhism, but they're, 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 they're not, of course. I mean, they're, they're very important. It's important for us to remember that many things in this world are outside of our control. If you've ever been in a car accident, it's a common enough occurrence that many of us have been in a car accident 
it gives you a sense, a small sense of the power that exists outside of our control. So used to being in control, right? Even when we drive the car, when we drive the car we feel so much in control. And we get this false sense of security that the car is a part of us, that doing what we tell it, just like our body, right? But just like our body, it doesn't really do what it, we tell it. I remember getting my first serious car accident was on an icy patch of road and spun totally out of control and almost hit a, f a telephone pole. And uh, just the power, what I remember so much was the power, the force of gravity and the force of inertia. So many things out of our control. The way we live our lives, trying to control, trying to set up our lives in a way that's always satisfying, that's always pleasant, it's not really tenable. It's not a very wise way to be. It's a great way to set yourself up for disappointment, set yourself up for trauma and stress and suffering. But granted it is one of the least important forces. It's important to realize that physical forces are out of our control, but there are more important forces. If there weren't, we'd be in serious trouble indeed because these things that are out of our control, if that was the most powerful force, we really wouldn't have any way of overcoming it. We, we can't prevent earthquakes. We can't prevent old age. We can't prevent death. Physical forces out of our control. And there are other forces. Um, one of the, the more, I suppose, uh, somewhat humorous sounding forces is the force of women. You might be surprised to know that the Buddha specifically mentioned the power of women. I think he even mentioned it when he was talking about the power of the sun, the power of the moon. I think the sun, the power of the sun, the power of the moon, the power of holy people who have magical powers, and then the power of women. But this gets into a different type of power. The power here is the power of manipulation. How women manipulate men's emotions and men manipulate women's emotions. And, of course, men manipulate men's. How we manipulate each other's emotions. Again, this is the reason he brings up women is because he's talking to a bunch of celibate, mainly heterosexual men. And uh, in a hetero, I think it's called heteronormative society, where women did have this power over over men, even though they were generally powerless. You know, if you want to turn the tables, you could say, well, the power of men is is equally fearsome. They would beat their wives and control their wives, even rape their wives. But talking to men, he reminds them of the power of women. You walk into the village for alms and some woman beguiles you and you're tormented with lust and desire and so on. This gets into the more important power, the power, because it's not actually the woman or the man or whoever has power. It's the power of the mind, starting with the power of, of, of defilement. You 
You can't control whether people are going to hurt you or manipulate you. And you can control how you react. So we have things like we talk about the power of positive thinking. Well, there's also the power of negative thinking. And this is where meditation really begins to work. It's what we be begin to see in the very beginning of our meditation practice is that much of who we are is made up of the patterns of behavior that we develop, cultivate throughout our lives, good and bad. We cultivate much that's to our benefit learning skills. It's amazing how we, the skills we can learn, no? Even just to speak is quite, a, quite an accomplishment. How we can string together all these complex words and grammar without even thinking. I'm able to use all the correct tenses and pronouns and word orders and synonyms and antonyms, big words, small words, all in the right order. It's quite incredible and do it without even thinking. It's a pattern of behavior, it's a habit that I've cultivated. Couldn't stop if I wanted to. If I wanted to start saying the words in a different order, it would take a whole new habit to learn. But much more important than those kinds of habits, of course, are the habits of ethical nature. And this is where Buddhism really focuses its attention in the Abhidhamma, for example, on our ethical habits. How we're habitually inclined to dislike pain. How we're habitually inclined to fear certain things to hate and to like and to love and to be attracted and repulsed by certain things, how we're inclined to be arrogant, conceited, uh, how we're inclined to be well, how we're inclined to react. And so it's a curious thing, a common question for meditators is that uh, they, they, they practice correctly and they are able to work out some of the problems in the mind so they think, yes, I practiced and my anger's gone, I'm no longer angry or I practiced and I'm no longer lusting after this or that. But they wonder why it comes back. They're doing everything right and it worked, but then it didn't do anything. The same problems come back. So we have to understand it's not magic and it's not like these are some embedded, ingrained part of ourselves that you're never going to be free from. You have to understand where they come from. If you want reassurance, that you are, that meditation is doing something. You have to understand what these things are. You have to stand, understand this concept of the power of cultivation, the power of cultivating certain habits, good habits, bad habits. So when you look at it that way, you understand that the anger and the greed and the delusion that's inside of us is something that we've cultivated as a habit. It keeps coming back because it's an echo of past uh, activities, past inclinations. And if we keep feeding it, it'll get stronger or it'll stay strong. But if we stop feeding it, it doesn't just disappear. There's a lot of power behind it. This is the most important power for a meditator to understand, in the beginning, for sure, anyway. Is to understand that meditating isn't just going to turn off your bad habits, but going to stop feeding them. It's going to cultivate opposing habits. Habits of contentment, habits of clarity, wisdom, humility. 
patience. And by cultivating these, they have a power of, this is the power of good things. So, when people talk about the power of positive thinking, it's apparently this idea that if you think positively, you get everything you want. Which may be true. I, I, people claim that you can manifest all the objects of your desire if you just have the right kind of thinking. But from a Buddhist point of view, that's not such a, it's not such a powerful thing. It's a dangerous thing. For the very reason that it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it increases your desire to get what you want. If you want to destroy someone completely, the easiest way is to give them everything they want. Because they'll take it. Maybe not the easiest way, but it's, it's the most sure way to destroy someone. Because they'll keep taking and taking and taking, and it's a path to self-destruction. That's how suffering works. Suffering comes from not getting what you want. The only way you can not get what you want is with wanting. The more you get, the more you want. The more you want, the more you suffer. So our meditation is about seeing these things. It's about seeing our our seeing the, the power that exists in the mind. And about changing the habits that we have, that we've cultivated, that we the things that we give power to, the things that we put our energy into. Everything. When you work, when you have a job and you work, you're cultivating, so you're giving energy to so many habits. You're cultivating so many good and bad habits when you, when you play games. So when, when children play tag or hide and go seek, they're putting energy into, from a very early age, we put energy into things and we cultivate habits. everything we do. We can't escape it. As a part of a, a part of the, the path is this realization where you start to get a little bit perturbed by your, by your ignorance and how you've been you've ignorantly been going about cultivating lots of bad habits. And so it's a wake up call. Where you start to decide to change your habits and to work towards cultivating good habits. Another power, I think, beyond this is is beyond the power of of the habits, is sort of hinting at it here is the power of of, of wisdom. So ordinary meditation, when people talk about energy, this is where they get this idea that there's energy flowing through their body or there's, you know, the energy that comes from meditation. This is much more to do with uh, tranquility meditation. It's these types of meditation that can be identi are identifiable by the, the power that they give to the mind, just powerful feelings, really. And they're powerful in the sense that they focus the mind and they tranquilize the mind and they stabilize the mind, they quiet the mind, they protect the mind. They have many, many good qualities to them. They even allow for other sorts of power, for reading people's minds, for remembering your past lives. You have such sharp memory you can remember even before you were born. Um, you know, all these magical powers that people, astral travel, is supposed to come from meditation. But that's just another one of these powers of, of you know, habit. You work at it enough and it changes the makeup of your mind. 
But wisdom is somehow different. Wisdom isn't like any other habit because it helps you understand your habits and it helps you see through them and to see that they're not your habits, that you're not in control. Rather than just creating new habits, you understand this through, through, our, through the meditation of being mindful. You understand the habit-creating activity and you start to you start to see through it and see beyond it and realize there's there's no point to it. It's much more powerful, but it's a power that doesn't feel powerful. It feels rather peaceful, rather innocent, in fact. And that's why mindfulness is such a... It's, it's easy to be... Well, it's hard to explain. But I think when you practice, it's hard to avoid understanding this concept. It doesn't feel powerful, per se, but it feels powerful in another way. It feels powerful in the sense of being invincible. And no matter what comes, when you're mindful, there's such a clarity and objectivity that nothing can hurt you, be it pain, be it, be it an earthquake, be it death, be it anger or greed or delusion, they just can't penetrate because the wisdom, the clarity of mind is, is too powerful, it's too strong. This means seeing things, seeing beyond habit creating, karma, you know, really we're talking about karma here. Seeing through this and, and just seeing things as arising and ceasing. Coming to understand that it doesn't really matter what happens. In the end, it's only just seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. Whether you live in a mansion or on the side of the road. There's no categorical difference. This allows you to see through this, see through the power and, and be stronger, be more powerful than, than any force on earth or in heaven power of wisdom. Perhaps the only thing more powerful than that is the power of, of Nibbana, enlightenment, freedom from suffering. Because it, it's so powerful that it doesn't even matter if you stop meditating. At that point, you're, you're, you've, that there's a categorical change. There's a change of lineage, they call it. Gotrabu becoming family, becoming a part of the noble clan, meaning that you've gone beyond samsara. You, you, even if you stop meditating entirely, there's, there's this clarity of mind that doesn't leave, can't leave. It's like you're broken. It can never put it back together again. So power is important. Energy is important, not in the way that I think a lot of meditators or meditation traditions talk about it. Energy in Buddhism is just power. It's just how, how there are these powers in the world that are important to recognize and play a, a, an important part in our meditation practice, not taking them for granted, not ignoring them, you know, the power of habits especially, because if you ignore it, you cultivate bad habits, even as meditators. Habits of avoiding, habits of trying to fix things, habits to, of habits of inclining towards certain states or being partial towards certain states. The only habit we should be creating is mindfulness. Seeing everything clearly and being present at all times. So, there you go. A little bit about power. I think it's an interesting topic. I hope you found that beneficial. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a good night.